um, I, I have graded your term, your mid midterms, and had sorry I tend to bring them in, and distributed them, and uh, rushed out, and forgot them. But I'll. I'll, I'll bring them in, in tomorrow, so when you give me your goodies, you can get one of your goodies back. <laughs> and uh, just for the the three people who had to do a retake on, on the Hebrew so that you don't have to wait for tomorrow, everyone who took the retake uh, passed, so uh, I expect to hear cheers there. <laughs> 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 right. So we do have class tomorrow? No, we do not have class tomorrow. So do we turn our papers to a box? Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hand them in to uh, to Hillary at the uh, switchboard. Uh, okay, and uh, and she will collect them. And if uh, she's not there in my mailbox, all right. Twelve o'clock sharp, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as I said, for the rest, we're interested in uh, the millennium question, uh, and uh, we'll be interested in all kinds of exegetical questions and uh, other things within Daniel 2 and 7, uh, but uh, with a view especially to the contribution they make to this pattern of eschatology. And... Uh, Just quickly, the, the millennial options. <coughs> In our analysis, I think it will be uh, useful to uh, deal with the question of where each millennial approach sees the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about the way in which God's kingdom is going to come in its glory and, and, and power. And, uh, you know, we all recognize that there are Old Testament prophecies uh, that uh, do point to that, that that glory stage of the kingdom, <clears throat> not just when the, there are the people of God in, in, <clears throat> in, in the world or, uh, uh, who, uh, in, in whose spirits uh, the Lord is working and so on, but, uh, but a stage in <clears throat> which the people of, of God will be politically uh, uh, dominant and uh, when their life as a, as a people of God, a, a golden age uh, type of thing, when God's people and, and indeed the whole world because uh, it's thought of as uh, the people of God being prevalent throughout the world will be enjoying prosperity and peace and so on. So at, at, at what point in their uh, uh, several reconstructions to the various millennial views posit uh, this the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies of the kingdom coming in power and, and, and glory. And uh, the way it works out is that <coughs> it is only the amillennial view that uh, sees this as something that follows the consummation. Both premillennial views and postmillennial views, for all of their differences uh, between them, uh, agree in this, that the kingdom prophecies we're talking about come to fulfillment before the consummation. Now, in the case of the premills, uh, you have the church age. And <clears throat> the church age, for them, ends with a crisis. And by the way, that's, that's a, another issue then that we will be focusing on, not just where do the, the various views put the uh, kingdom of power and glory, but how do they understand the, the crisis, uh, and especially in dealing with premillennialism, it becomes two crises, and so that's an issue. Is there one crisis? Or are there two crises? And, and uh, what, what's the relationship between uh, Gog and Magog, and uh, Antichrist, and, and uh, two separate events, one event? That, uh, so on, on a, on a premill scheme, <coughs> thinking of, of classic pre-mill, not necessarily just sensationalist pre-mill. Uh, on, on a classic uh, pre-mill scheme, church age ends with uh, an, an antichrist crisis. Man of sin. And uh, that is the occasion then of the parousia. And the parousia introduces for them the millennium. 
and the millennium. X marks the spot. X equals the kingdom, common power, and glory. All right? So for them, the kingdom comes in power and glory after the parousia, but the parousia for them is not the consummation. Hmm? For them, the consummation doesn't come till the end of a thousand years, which they place after that. And moreover, then for them, there is there is crisis number two, and, and ends the millennium, and introduces the consummation. And of course, uh, the, thereafter, that the kingdom is present in, in power and glory, but it has already been that before the consummation. So but we have <coughs> the other feature as well. They have an antichrist crisis here, and then they have the Gog-Magog crisis here, uh, based on Revelation 20, where it says that at the end of the thousand years, Satan is, is loosed, and he guys together all the hordes, Gog and Magog, with the utilization of uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And, and so they see that as a second crisis, separate from that, from uh, the Antichrist crisis, and that will be one of our main uh, in interests, is to show the falseness uh, of that separation. We're going to be uh, arguing to show the identity uh, of... of uh, Antichrist and Gog is Antichrist, and uh, it's, it's one crisis, not not two. That will be one of our criticisms of premillennialism. All right, so that's that scheme. <coughs> now, of course, we, we, the the traditional terminology pre, post, and ah is based on how the return of our Lord relates to the thousand years on any given view. And pre-mills are called, of course, pre-mills because they, they see the parousia as coming before pre-1,000 years, so we call them pre-millennial. Uh, I'm going to suggest that other terminology is, uh, is more productive of uh, conducive to a real insight in the thing. Uh, but uh, first and post-mills... <coughs> Church age, they too are obliged to recognize, though they would would minimize it with all might and main as much as they could. Uh, the church age ends in in, in a crisis. You know? But the church age is over against pre mills. Post mills have correctly interpreted this. The, the thousand years, rather, they have correctly interpreted as, as being identifiable with the present church age. And for them, of course, then parousia <coughs> is consummation. Parousia, which ends a thousand years, is at the same time then the, the consummation uh, of the world. And, and so they have only one crisis. Not, not two, and the millennium is now, not later. In terms of where X marks the spot, however, uh, here is the feature of, of post-millennialism. X marks the spot now. The millennium they interpret as a, <coughs> a fulfillment of uh, the Old Testament prophecies of the kingdom coming in power and glory. And uh, now, obviously, we are in that church age, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but this is what the, the, is the expectation of theonomists, and this is what they are working for. Uh, the, they are trying to theocratize the nations of the world right here and now, the result of which would be a manifestation of God's rule in, in power and, and glory, suppressing other religions and, and enforcing uh, the true religion. Now, it hasn't happened yet, and so it, it, if they are identifying <coughs> the whole church age with the millennium, <clears throat> well, there's a little tension in there thinking that the millennium is the time when the kingdom comes in power and glory, and yet for 2,000 years now, uh, that, that hasn't happened. And uh, so yeah, I have found in dealing with them that they have a difference of opinion as to whether the 1,000 years should be thought of as uh, equated with the, the whole church age or just a section of it at the end. And I think in terms of what I was just saying, that the more consistent view for them would be to say that the 1,000 years then is... is the, the latter end of the 
uh, of the church uh, is uh, exclusively that, uh, that's something then that, that, according to them, could be a, a kingdom of, of power and glory. But uh, meanwhile, it comes, whether sooner or later, it comes within the millennium, which is the present church age. And uh, so, before the consummation, after the parousia, uh, on, on premial view, the kingdom comes uh, uh, after the parousia, before the consummation. On, on their view, it uh, comes, uh, yeah, well, it, it comes with the parousia and the consummation uh, together. And uh, the crisis here becomes a problem for, for them, as I say, because they, their expectation is by that point, uh, we will have had the, the Christianity and Christ as, as the dominant world religion, and how then you can account for a, a, a global worldwide uprising such as is depicted in the passages dealing with this crisis, you know, that, that's a real problem. And the result of which is that they are driven into a, a preterist uh, view of as many of the passages that deal with that crisis as they possibly can and try to say that the passages describing that <coughs> crisis have to do with something that has happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD or to the Roman Empire in the past. And so they, by their preterist hermeneutic, they get rid of as much evidence as they can that we would uh, tone down the tension created by a that kind of a crisis after a supposed coming of the kingdom and, and, and power and glory. But the one passage they obviously can't deal with uh, as something <coughs> earlier in, in the millennium is the one in Revelation 20 which says that after the millennium uh, there is this uh, gathering of Gog and Magog. So the, uh, that Gog Magog thing mentioned after the thousand years of Revelation 20 is just there and so they just have to do things as best they can to, to minimize the significance of of that, so that, <coughs> not crisis. But in any case, uh, coming of the kingdom and power and glory, X marks the spot, is before the consummation on their view, just as it was on, on uh, the premillennial view. Now that leaves only then the amial view <coughs> that will differ in this basic respect. We too see the present church age as the millennium, and thus post-millennialists and, and amillennialists agree formally as to when the millennium takes place, it takes place now. But in substance, so we, we disagree then totally in, in that we have a, a different views as to what is the nature of the millennium. Post mills agree with pre mills that the millennium is a time of outward triumph. Our mills then say, yes, this is the millennium, but the millennium is not a time of outward triumph. The millennium is the time of the Great Commission and the Great Tribulation. It's the time when the church is the martyr church in the double sense, witness, suffer. And it's the, the, that characterizes the total church age. And as a matter of fact, then, the crisis that comes at the end is no surprise. It's more of the same. <coughs> it is what has been going on all along, in, intensified indeed. Uh, <coughs> but that, that, that doesn't create any, any kind of tension for our view as it does for uh, uh, the, the, the post mills, but it is a, a totally different concept of, of what is the nature of the millennium that we get here. And uh, so, all right, at the end of the thousand years, at the end of the, that Gog-Magog crisis, which uh, for us is, of course, the Antichrist crisis, and just that one, uh, then the parousia and the consummation, and then X marks the spot not in the millennium, but in the consummation stage. <coughs> so on the amillennial scheme, the parousia is a rendering of dual verdicts, the ultimate judgment. On the one hand, the great white throne judgment destroys the world forever. And it's only after the world power is utterly destroyed that the other thing <coughs> immediately then also <coughs> takes place the introduction of God's kingdom as universal, eternal, triumphant. Uh, uh, and that's the, the simple eschatological pattern then that we are interested in developing. We're going to look at Daniel 2, we're going to look at Daniel 7, and we're going to see that it's precisely this that comes across in those two passages. It is only when the world power has been destroyed, when the image has been destroyed, chapter 2, 
when the beast and the little horn have been destroyed, chapter 7, it's only at that point that you get the fifth kingdom, the kingdom of God coming in as the, uh, as the kingdom of power and glory in chapter 2 and 27. This is the pattern that we'll try to demonstrate there in Daniel 2 and 7. And it, uh, it contradicts uh, both of these other approaches. So I think instead of talking about where the millennium comes with respect to the parousia and calling things pre, post, and on in, in those terms, what we should be asking is the question, where does the coming of the kingdom and power and glory come with respect to the consummation? That's the real question. And it's uh, that kind of difference that really distinguishes these different views from uh, one another. And in, in those terms, pre-mills and post-mills are pre-consummation views. They are pre-consummation. They both say the kingdom comes in power before the consummation, even though the pre-mills uh, distinguish between the parousia and, and uh, the consummation. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the, consumma- the kingdom comes in power before the, the, the consummation on their view, as of course it does on the post. O- only the Amil view is a post-consummation view. So you have two pre-consummation views, and only the Amil is a post-consummation. Kingdom comes in power and glory after uh, the consummation, after the final judgment. So that's the general s- structures that we have in mind, and uh, with uh, that, then we can turn to the details of these chapters 2 and, and 7 in, in Daniel. In both chapters, as you well know, we, in, we encounter the four world kingdoms, and we've talked about them and other connections of the higher criticism of the book and the structure of it and so on. And we've seen how chapters 2 and and then seven relate to one another in the structure as both dealing with the four world empires and God's kingdom as, as the fifth. And we've maintained uh, that the, the sequence of four kingdoms is Babylon, one, two, Medo-Persia, three, Greece, and four, Rome. The, the Rome, the, the fourth, the one, however, divided into stage A and, and uh, B. And uh, now in... Uh, in, in uh, a little bit uh, on that subject in defense of, of those identifications. Uh, uh, we'll just take a, a brief look at some of the evidence here in Daniel 8 for a second. In, uh, in Daniel uh, 2, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Daniel 2 has answered the question, who is the first, uh, uh, which is the first king of this? Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonia. He's the head of gold, or the equivalent would be the first beast in in, in chapter uh, 7. Now what we want to see further is that the book uh, it, uh, Daniel itself rather clearly in chapter 8 identifies the second and third kingdoms for us, which uh, as Medo-Persia and Greece respectively, <coughs> which leaves Rome then as the fourth one. The evidence in uh, chapter 8 it has again to do with animal symbolism, the, uh, the animals of the ram and the he-goat. And in chapter 8, verse uh, the 3, it talks about this ram uh, with the two horns, one higher than the other, uh, which is identified the, uh, a little later on in verse 20 as the Medes and the Persians. So the ram represents, the text itself tells us, that the Medes and the Persians. And in terms of equivalency uh, with, uh, let's say, the, the, let's look at the seventh chapter of Daniel where you also have beasts. Uh, in terms of equivalency, the, the ram corresponds uh, to the second of the four beasts in chapter seven. The second is the bear. And just as the ram has two horns, one higher than the other in chapter eight, so the, the, the bear, the second beast in chapter, five, uh, in chapter seven, is raised up on one side. So it's this two-sidedness that is emphasized in, in both the, the ram and, and the bear, and, uh, and the, the raised up on one side over the other, which of course uh, re- reflects this, the dominance of Persia over the Medes in, in the hyphenated Medo-Persian uh, kingdom. Well, as for the career of this ram, uh, it, it is said to push in three directions, to the north and the west and the south, and again, the correspondence in the case of the bear of chapter 7 is that he has three ribs in his mouth that he has overcome uh, uh, and, and dominated. 
Well, then moving beyond the ram, and then we, uh, w which, as I said, is identified right in verse 20 as the, the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. Moving beyond the ram, we have the emergence then of the figure of the male goat, the he goat, with the notable horn, which comes from the west with great speed over all of the world, and which, again, the text itself, this time in verse 21, identifies for us as Greece. And, uh, and, and, of course, this uh, he-goat corresponds to the third of the beasts in chapter 7. The ram corresponded to the second, which was the bear, and the he-goat corresponds to the third, which is the, the leopard. And so we want to note the points of correspondence. Uh, that then between the he-goat with its notable horn and the speed with which it went from the west over all the earth, and uh, likewise then the, 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 le the leopard, the third beast in chapter 7, is uh, ha said to have four wings, uh, and uh, which result in his speed, his rapid conquest uh, uh, of the world. Uh, well, the he-goat then, the notable horn, uh, uh, comes and destroys the ram, and of course the, the Medo-Persians uh, uh, <coughs> were destroyed by the Greeks uh, under Alexander. And then Alexander died in the height of his career there, and which is reflected in the symbolism of the text by saying that that great notable horn of the he-goat was broken. And in place of Alexander, his kingdom then was divided among four uh, other areas and uh, represented by four horns, uh, the, that uh, four other horns that came up, the notable horn having been uh, cut down and four others uh, re replace it, out, out of one of which uh, there comes a, a little horn. And uh, so that will be of particular interest, that little mm -hmm. horn, that anti Antiochus figure there. Uh, but as for the parallelism with the leopard, the third beast of uh, chapter 7, uh, the four horns of the he-goat are matched by four heads. And so the numerical symbolism uh, picks up. And uh, so, so that's what we have going for us there. And, uh, and as I said, uh, the, that he goat is identified as Greece, and the effect of that is to identify then the, the parallel uh, leopard of chapter 7 as, as uh, Greece. So chapter 8 very, very clearly establishes the traditional understanding of the second uh, beast as the uh, Medo-Persians uh, and the third as Greece, which of course, as we said, leaves the fourth one uh, then to be uh, Rome. Now that evidence uh, would seem uh, nice and clear and, and simple. One complicating feature now, however, is uh, this. It has to do with the little horn. And as we saw in chapter 8, the little horn is uh, definitely something that has to do uh, with uh, developments in in the, the, the post-Alexander phase of the, the Greek Empire, when it's been divided up into four sections, represented by four horns, and uh, especially for the Book of Daniel, uh, Syria with uh, the uh, Seleucids and, and Greece with uh, the Ptolemies are the two main ones of the four we're interested in. And it is out of the uh, Seleucid branch, that, that, little, uh, that horn, that a, a little horn emerges, and uh, we're on all sides agreed that's Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, that little horn that comes from one of uh, uh, the, the four. Now the hitch, uh, the, the thing that, that uh, the modern critics who are going for this totally different understanding of the four kingdoms as Babylon one, Medes second, Persians third, and, and, and uh, Greeks four, uh, what they appeal to is the presence of a, a little horn in uh, chapter 7. <coughs> all right, this is in Tychus Epiphanes. All right. We're all agreed, the one in uh, the little horn in chapter 8 that we were just talking about. But now in chapter 7, you go through the, the four beasts, and then after the, the leopard, you have this fourth monster. With the uh, with the ten horns, and uh, then there emerges the little horn as an eleventh that plucks up three of the ten, and uh, the, the rest of the story all concerns this little horn, who for three and a half times is blaspheming God and persecuting the saints and prevailing against them and so on, and which, of course, on our view, the fourth kingdom is Rome. 
And by the time you come beyond stage A with the ten horns to stage B, which is this little horn, on our understanding of it, you are concerned now with the whole church age again, that same three and a half years that in uh, Daniel 9, the 70 weeks passage we saw marks the whole church age from the church's disengagement from Jerusalem 70 AD right to the consummation. So again, here in uh, Daniel 7, uh, that's what it represents. And so for us, this little horn is a phenomenon of the, the church age and the beast itself is of course Rome. Now, problem uh, the critics bring up is look, the little horn of chapter seven must be the same as the little horn of chapter eight. And we're all agreed that the little horn of chapter eight is Antiochus Epiphanes. Therefore, in spite of whatever other evidence there is, this must all be wrong. And uh, the little horn here is the same one. And therefore, the beast that from which he, he comes, that nameless monster, uh, it must be Greece, not Rome, just as it was over here. So that's the problem, is the presence of this same symbolism. Now, as I, I would put it, the, what the Bible does, it uses the, the same symbol of a little horn to re represent the equivalence in Old Testament history and in uh, New Testament history. So here are two figures, Antiochus Epiphanes there, Antichrist here, who perform similar roles with respect to the church in, in their own particular eras, namely as the, the great enemy of the church who persecutes and suppresses true religion in, in each in his own time. And therefore, I, I, and I don't like to use the word typology for this, uh, I, I like to <coughs> reserve the language of typology for God, the enterprise of God's kingdom. So God arranges things so that there are prototypes and then antitypes uh, and pre-Messianic priests and prophets and kings and the Messianic pro uh, uh, priest, prophet and king typology describing uh, God's holy re redemptive developments and I don't therefore like to use the term typology or if we can avoid it for the satanic enterprise but nevertheless we, we can acknowledge that there's the earlier and the, and the, the later stages in the satanic enterprise with the uh, correspondences between the, the two figures and because of that the, the, the same image of the little horn is selected. Now what I would like to do how is to show is that in spite of the, the same symbol being used that whatever is predicated about this one however similar to what is predicated about this one there are major differences that demand that we, we do not identify the two with one another. Now what are those differences? It begins with just the, the numerics uh, and, and the, the imagery of it. Uh, here is a little horn that emerges <coughs> in a situation where there are four horns and it emerges as one of those four from the head of a of beast, uh, he goat, which is very much like the ram puff as, as far as that goes. Here, as far as the numerics are concerned, it, it is an eleventh horn that does not come from one of the, the, the ten, but arises as one uh, alongside of it, and as emerging not from just another beast uh, like uh, uh, the he goat, like the ram, but by a, a totally nondescript, nameless thing, because it is uh, the, the, this a uh, hybrid draconic thing, and, and so the, the numerics of their origin and so forth are quite different. And then, of course, the little horn emerges directly from the beast, whereas uh, this little horn in chapter 80 emer emerges from one of the four horns and so on. So the symbolism beyond just the, the bare designation little horn is, is totally uh, different. Yes, they both persecute the saints, and uh, yet the object of the, the opposition of, of uh, the little horn in chapter 8, if you study the whole chapter there and, and also compare chapters 10 and, and 11, uh, the opposition of, of this Antiochus Epiphanes symbol is definitely to the, the, the ceremonial, symbolic uh, cultus of, of, of the Old Testament, its temple, its altar, its, its sacrifices. Whereas the little horn of chapter 7 uh, is uh, one who, who, in persecuting the saints of, of the Most High, uh, also is said to oppose the Lord in a more basic way, a more self-exalting, a more self-deifying 
where he is described as the one who seeks to change the laws and the seasons. Language which elsewhere in the book of Daniel is, is used for God himself. He is the one who, de- who determines and changes the, the times and the seasons, raising up one king, putting down another. That language which has been used to describe the, the sovereignty of God himself in history is used to describe the aspirations of this uh, particular little horn in, in terms of, of, of the symbolism it uh, the determining of the times and the seasons and uh, of the nations and the kings and so on. Uh, the, the background of this would be found in the concept of the tablets of destiny uh, that you find in, in, in ancient uh, literature of the times uh, with the, the different gods rivaling one another to get hold of, of the tablets of destiny because to have the tablets of destiny you determine the times and the seasons and so on. So that, that's part of the background of what's going on here. It's, it's that which belongs to the victorious deity uh, to change the times and the seasons. And that's the kind of thing that is predicated of, uh, of the little horn in, in chapter 7, whom we would see as the Antichrist at the end of uh, history, is over against uh, Tychus Epiphanes over uh, uh, here. So in their points of origins, they differ in, in terms of the, their, the, 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 the radicalness of, of their... Uh, career persecution of the, the people and their, their, their deification of themselves, big difference between the two. And then as, as to the uh, termination of their careers and, and what that signifies for, for human history as a whole, well, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, that, that little horn is uh, finally done away with, and uh, that does not mark the end of the world. History goes on. It, it does, it's not the occasion for the coming in of the, uh, the kingdom of God in any uh, fresh way or anything. Uh, whereas in chapter 7, it's the end of history. For the Antichrist uh, figure, the, the, the little <coughs> horn and the beast from which he comes to be destroyed in the fire by the, the Son of Man, that does mark the, the end of history. That is that point that we talked about uh, where the, the dual things happened at the parousia where the, the world power is totally eliminated forevermore and the kingdom of God is simultaneously introduced forevermore uh, that, that's what marks or put it the other way the, little, the, the judgment of this little horn his end marks that point in, in history the end of the world the introduction of the kingdom in, in power and glory altogether different significance than the end of Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. Critics who identify these two, what can they say about what's going on here then? That this little horn's death, if it's Antiochus Epiphanes, and it, that did bring the end of the world, but this, this chapter is saying that the end of this little horn does bring the end of the world. Ah, too bad, the prophecy failed. But that's what you're going to be driven to, you see. You're going to have to be driven to the position that if you say that they're the same figure, that this is Antichrist, you're going to have to also say that uh, the the Bible failed here, that prophecy simply did not not, uh, come to pass. Someone in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes wrote this and uh, predicted something then uh, that uh, didn't come come uh, to pass and so I, I trust you can see that in spite of the, the, the surface uh, plausibility of, of the argument that they must be the same ones and that therefore this one must be a type that uh, looking at all the details they point in quite a different uh, direction. Any question or discussion with uh, this? So we, with that uh, then we return to our analysis of the chapters in themselves for, for other points. When we come to chapter 7 we'll come back and, and, and survey some of the different possibilities as we did with the 70 weeks passage, the critical and typological and the dispensationalist views. But let's uh, start in, in Daniel 2 now, which is the vision of Nebuchadnezzar about the four world kingdoms. And the dyna- dynamics of it are simple enough. You have an image which is divided into one, two, three, four parts, and the fourth is A, A and B. So there's the head of gold, there's the, the breast and the arms of silver, there's the thighs in the middle of, uh, of uh, bronze, and then there are the legs of uh, iron, stage A. 
and there are the feet, all right, so the ankles, let's say, is the cutoff point between stage A and B, and there are the feet uh, of, of iron and clay. Big, impressive image. This is the way Nebuchadnezzar sees the world. Uh, and this represents the, the, the way he handles his, his power and so on, uh, as is reflected in Daniel 3, the very next chapter, where you have another image, uh, that, that, uh, the one that Nebuchadnezzar himself sets up in, uh, uh, as uh, part of his determination of, of what and when and who uh, people are, are to worship. It's part of his exalting himself and his uh, power beyond what it should be. So th th that's what's going on. Uh, here is the, the world enterprise. Here is human kingship institutionalized in nations of uh, the world come to expression as something impressive, awesome, man-made, all these ma metallic uh, uh, substances uh, used uh, to uh, represent it. And uh, the picture then is uh, one of human kingship, the man, huh? Against okay, so over this man, of course, we're going to have the son of man later on, who is the, the, the true man, the true fulfillment of, of human kingship. Uh, but, but here is human kingship, which in itself is le a legitimate thing, of course. And, and we emphasize when we talk about common grace and how God institutes the state as a, a provision of his common grace. Chapter 4, Genesis, verse 15, where he... Uh, provides the charter of the city already to Cain and, uh, in the pre-Diluvian age, and the city is set up there. And once again, in the covenant of common grace in Genesis 9, God reestablishes the, the state, a, a good and a proper, legitimate, God-given uh, arrangement, uh, human kingship uh, institutionalized in, in the state. And uh, so in itself, it isn't perverse, but it becomes perverse. And uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, Babylon, uh, 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 and, and in, uh, this image of chapter 2 and the image of chapter 3, we, we see how it, it gets uh, perverted. So that as we uh, look at what's going on here and we compare it, especially with those early chapters of Genesis where the, we have the institution of the state and, and how it quickly went from bad uh, to perverse and led up to the flood. And then after the flood reappears in the form of, of Babylon, in, in chapter 11, Babylon, which of course is where we are here in this image. Here, here are the roots of, of, uh, of Daniel 2, and, and it's a, a great uh, understanding and expression of the, the world power. Here are the roots of that in, in, uh, back in, in Genesis 11, the, the original founding of, of uh, uh, Babylon. So the things then that, that come out here are the, 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 the impressiveness of the thing, the, the way in which the world looks at what it has done as something which is odd and, and inspiring and, and an occasion for glory and, and uh, so, so forth. As of course, uh, as we read along about Nebuchadnezzar is what he does with it. And, and we read about him in chapter four is marching around on, on, uh, on to this new city of, of Babel. It's not this that great city which I have built for my residence for the, you know, for the glory of my majesty and, and power and so on. So, yeah, he, he glories in this thing as uh, uh, something which uh, redounds to, to his own self uh, uh, deification. And uh, so the, that is the per perversity of what's going on here, which is re reflects what was going on back in Genesis 6, where we, we had about the sons of God after the dynasty of Cain has developed for a while and described in Genesis uh, Four, and then the other genealogy of the saints in chapter 5 and then chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 <coughs> come back to, to the climax of the history of the world that then was with uh, what human kings uh, were doing Lamech-like, huh? remember? Uh, Lamech-like, they, they are despising the institutions of the family and the state and they are exalting themselves above uh, the name of uh, the Lord and, uh, and uh, that's the kind of thing that is uh, uh, going on here, and that's what is reflected in the career of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, uh, sort of the, the fulfillment of, of the mandate of, of human kingship is, is, is in a way realized him. Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom is exalted to heaven. You have the image of the cosmic tree in the following chapter too, representing Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, the, the original ideal of man ruling over the whole 
world exercising dominion is, is sort of come to expression in a perverse way, of course, here in, in Nebuchadnezzar. And this re- tree of his reaches to the top of heaven, and uh, under it there ha- are harbored all of the, the beasts of the, the field and so on. It's a virtual uh, Adam with dominion over the world uh, come to fruition. Now, again, I say um, with, with perverseness, with the divine uh, kingship uh, ideology. So it's uh, Genesis 6 all over again in, in, in this perverse way. Um, but it's also, in a, and especially in Genesis 11 all over again. And uh, In Genesis 11, after the, the flood, and they're on their way again, and the same old urban ideology is, is developing, and uh, with a, a special emphasis on the thought of cohesion now. Uh, so as a result of the fall, there's the curse which results in, in scattering and dispersion, and that's the tendency. And, and the people at, at, at in the plains of Shinar feel that, and, and they want to correct the, that uh, centrifugal curse power that's in the world, driving men apart from one another, that they want to uh, I- inject a centripetal uh, force that will bring them cohesively together, lest we be further scattered upon the face of the earth. And so let's build this tower. Uh, they, uh, they missed the Armageddon mountain of God, which was the cohesive center of life uh, before the fall, uh, connecting heaven and, and earth, and uh, that's gone. And uh, they, they see that as the thing that is necessary if there's going to be togetherness, and if there's to be togetherness uh, again in a way that connects us with, uh, with heaven and immortality and divine glory, uh, again, uh, that's what's going on in in Genesis uh, 11, and that's very much what informs the symbolism now in, in Daniel 2. The ideal is, is one of, of cohesiveness, of ecumenical, political uh, togetherness, and so they, of course, tried to build, <coughs> they had tried to build uh, the, the tower that would lead to heaven, and uh, uh, here it's that same ideal. Now look, as you look at the image, there is a decreasing value in, 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 as, as you go down from the top of the image to the bottom. The, met, the metals, for one thing, gold, silver, brass, iron, clay, from the top to the bottom, increase are de- decreasing value, <clears throat> symbolized by the, the lesser value of the success of metals. And secondly, just positionally, just positionally, as you go from the top to the bottom, you go from the top to the bottom. It's, it's a, de- a decrease, it's a downward direction. And so the question is, in what respect now is the, the head of gold at the top, Babylon, the great, and, and Rome, what not at the bottom, is lesser? And uh, I, I think the clue to it comes out in, in the structure of the anatomy as well. The head is the unified head. As you move down the body, there's the bifurcation, there's the duality of the breast and the arms. Right down through the rest of the body, there's the increasing complexity rather than unified nature of it, which is highly emphasized when you get down, especially to the end of this decreasing process, when you get down to the feet, which are no longer even of, of one metal, uh, of lesser value as it was, the iron. It's no longer even just iron when you get down to the feet, but it's a mixture now of iron and clay. And in fact, this mixture is itself identified as one that is not cohesive. So the, 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 <coughs> the clue to the what establishes the greater value and, and the lesser value, the, the clue is, is this increasing complexity of, of the structure of the, the image. And uh, so in other words, it's in terms of cohesiveness. Now when you come to the, the seventh kingdom and uh, the four beasts, the best seems to come at the end with the fourth beast, the, the, the best in a perverse sense. Huh? But there, the, the, the ideal is that of power, hmm? and destruction especially, destructive power. And uh, in, in those terms, uh, Rome beats them all. And uh, so that's the greatest. Now here it's, that kind of power is not the thing, but unity. And in those terms, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon, though the smallest of them all, well, was by that very token the, the most cohesive of them all. 
And as you move along, each successive empire embodying within its new and enlarged bounds, the previous ones, becomes a, a complex entity. And so and the Medo-Persian Empire, a duality and so on. Uh, the, the Greeks with the four parts to the Rome coming along with its so a world uh, wide complex. And uh, so uh, Daniel 2 then, yeah, I think, ties in very closely with Genesis 11, where cohesiveness together, the, the ecumenical one, that is, is the, the, the ideal in terms of which uh, things are, are, are measured. Well, of course, the judgment corresponds then. The dynamics of the chapter are very simple. We begin with the image standing there and all its impressive uh, this, and uh, it's all downhill from there as uh, there's this other little mountain over here from which a stone is cut out and strikes the image on, on the feet. The cutting out of the stone from the little mountain. The mountain clearly is uh, the Old Testament theocracy. The little stone is clearly Messiah who is cut out. First coming, cut out from the mountain. Strikes the image on the feet at the end of the story. It's the end of the thing. It's not up here someplace, not at the ankles. No, it's at the very end of the development. And uh, therefore, the striking of the image is not the first coming of Christ, it's the second coming, it's the parousia. But the result then of the striking of this image at the bottom, uh, 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 as in chapter 7, the, the judgment comes at the end of history with the entire Antichrist figure is very plain there. And so chapters 2 and 7 help to interpret one another back and forth. And in each case, the judgment comes at the same place. And chapter 7 is clearly at the second coming, and in chapter 2 it is as well. And the net result is then cohesion is the ideal, Pulver, pulverizing the actual result as a result of God's judgment. Return to the dust, the wind scattering, the complete deconstruction. Deconstruction is uh, the result. And the little stone that strikes the image and, and destroys it becomes <coughs> the great mountain, <coughs> the antitype, the similarity, but with a difference. The little mountain it's cut out from it becomes the great mountain that fills the earth, the kingdom coming in power and glory. Where's the fulfillment of Daniel, the true picture of, of judgment? Is it in the present church age? Uh, as Post will say, is it uh, after the parousia but before the consummation? As Primo say, no, it's, uh, it's something that comes after the final judgment, after the destruction of the world, after the consummation. And, uh, okay, that, that's the, the simple uh, message of Daniel 2. We'll have to look at it again, but we won't be doing that till next week. Now, next week, do we meet both? I, I haven't got my list here. Do we meet both uh, Tuesday and Wednesday? No? Next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about the following week? Both days the following week? Okay, but there aren't many more, are there? <coughs> All right. And I'll be looking for your little gems tomorrow. <laughs> four more hours or four more days?